Well, thank you everybody for joining us. I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Marians here at the Shrine of Divine Mercy. And we're so grateful that you could be with us today live here at the National Shrine uh, on March 19th. And this is a special day, few people remember, but most Catholics do, that is the feast day of St. Joseph. So this is an incredibly important saint right behind the Blessed Virgin Mary. And we're gonna talk about some new things today. And one of the things I'm gonna start touch on is spiritual warfare and Saint um, Joseph, because we're all facing it, especially now. And there are some things that I learned in seminary, also talking with some of our theologians like Chris Sparks, that are powerful that we want to share with you today about that. So let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you all thanks and praise and glory, especially on this day for the gift of St. Joseph. We ask that like Mother Mary, we take him into our hearts. We ask for his protection. And as the terror demons, we ask that those who are oppressing us, obsessing or even possessing us, that he may, through his intercessionary power, give, take them flight. And so we ask all this, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Before we begin, we have a quick announcement. I'll also reiterate this at the end, but we will be changing schedule on these Saturday talks. Uh, we will be going digitally online for the next several weeks, not in person, and so we'll give more details at the end, so please stay tuned at the end for that detail. But first Saturdays will remain always live here, and the changes here will only be temporary. So, All right, now, as you saw from the slide, St. Joseph is the terror of demons. We, we have a great advocate here. And uh, so St. Saint, Saint, uh, Joseph is the one that we want to turn to, especially when we are facing spiritual warfare. Now, today is March 19th. Or even if you're watching this talk after March 19th, that's okay. But why was March 19th chosen as St. Joseph's feast day? All right, and remember, a saint has a particular power on this day given by God, not from him. But the grace of God goes through these saints and on a saint's feast day, he's granted special gifts. Now let's look at our next slide. This is March 19th. That's St. Joseph. And that's a beautiful picture of him with the Christ child. And it's traditionally, this was the date that St. Joseph died. Now he's also May 1st. But May 1st has to do with St. Joseph the laborer, the, the worker. And that's because May Day was in, May 1st was always a communist celebration of communism. And so the church put May 1st as a true labor for St. Joseph. But today, March 19th, is traditionally believed as the day he died. And so this is interesting because um, this is when we celebrate it. Now, <clears throat> here's what's interesting. Um, the oldest celebration of this feast appears among the Coptic Christians, all right, who they celebrated it though on July 20th. The reason that we have the date of March 19th is because we believe he died on March 19th because surprisingly of what we call the apocryphal writings. Okay, I want to take a moment to explain this because this could be a whole other talk. How did we get the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Do you know at the time that those gospels were first distributed to the known world, you had the gospels of Thomas, the gospels of Peter, the gospel of Mary. Now that does not mean they were written by Thomas, Peter, and Mary. Uh-uh. They were just called that. And so somebody would say, well, gee, Father, if it was written by Mary, why in the world is that not in the Bible? No, the Gospel of Thomas, Peter, or Mary were not written by them. They were written by other authors. Now it was the Catholic Church that determined, and this is why when non-Catholics criticize the Catholic Church continuously that we don't read our Bible, we don't know our Bible, you have to ask, 
Do you know where the Bible came from? Well, it came from God, of course. Of course it came from God, but who determined when God became active in the world from the very beginning, Adam and Eve, he's been active in the world, but all of a sudden, in the first century, we got all these gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Thomas, Mary, Peter, we have all these gospels. Who determined which ones went into the Bible? The Catholic Church. So even our Protestant brethren, our non-Catholic brethren that read from the Bibles, they have the very same Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Gospels. You have to ask them, you can't accept that Bible and reject the authority from which it came. It came from the Catholic Church. Now again, it all comes from God, but it was the Catholic Church that determined that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the only inspired ones by, written by the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that tell us about the others? About Matthew, uh, excuse me, Peter and the Gospel of, uh, of uh, Mary and the Gospel of Thomas and others. What does that tell the Gospel of James? What does that tell us about them? Okay, the church has always said that they're not inspired, meaning they don't come in the same level of importance of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But we can learn some things from them. They have historical facts, like my birthday, July 26th, that's the feast of Joachim and Anne. That is the parents of Mary. We know and celebrate that, even the church puts it on the calendar because it comes from those apocryphal gospels. So the church doesn't throw them away completely. A lot of times critics will come to us and say, uh, the church um, hides these things because they, they try to say that they're no good. No, the church has is, is, uh, taken a lot of information from those books. And one of them is the date of St. Joseph. St. Joseph dying on March 19th is the tradition from those other Gospels. It's not mentioned in our Gospel. Now, I want to read you something else that's in those Gospels because we don't see them as infallibly true like we do Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they're interesting nonetheless and we can learn from them. Now, the church does not teach that we have to believe Joseph was never married before Mary. There's a strong tradition that he was not and that he was a virgin. Father Don Calloway holds to this. I personally do too. But you are not required as Catholics. Now, here's something interesting taken from the Apocryphal Gospels. And this is in the Catholic Encyclopedia. The Catholic Encyclopedia asked the question if Joseph was married before Mary to a woman named Melka and had six children. Now, in one sense, it would partially explain why they say Jesus had brothers. They would be stepbrothers and sisters. Now, I personally am not believing of that. So, as you know, I always say, please have mercy on the letters and sending to my superiors. I'm just reporting what the church has said over the years. And here's what the Catholic Encyclopedia says about what was taken from the apocryphal writings. These apocryphal writings have no authority. They said, when 40 years of age, Joseph married a woman called Melka, or Esha by some, Salome by others. They lived 49 years together and had six children, two daughters and four sons, the youngest of whom was James the Less who in the Bible, our real Bible, says the Lord's brother. Kind of interesting. A year after his wife's death, he espoused, was espoused to Mary, then between 12 and 14 years of age. Joseph was 90 years old at the time. This is where I find that a little hard to believe. He went up to Jerusalem among the candidates and a miracle manifested the choice God had made of Joseph, 
Remember where they laid their staffs, right? And Joseph's staff sprouted a lily? That tradition all comes from these apocryphal gospels. But we cannot take these as having authority. We cannot take these as being equal to our Bible. We cannot. But historically speaking, for facts and dates, kind of interesting. Okay, God had made the choice of Joseph, and two years later, the Annunciation took place. These dreams are void of authority. Here the Catholic Encyclopedia is saying they have no authority in these statements. They nevertheless acquired in the course of ages some popularity amongst Christians. In them, some ecclesiastical writers sought the answer to the well-known difficulty arising from the mention in the Gospels of the Lord's brother. That's James the Less. Or the belief that St. Joseph was older at the time of the marriage with Mary. You know, it's, it's interesting because <clears throat> today's our 89th episode. And it's funny because um, the other writing I saw said Joseph was 89, not, Mar not, not uh, 90. Today's our 89th episode. They said St. Joseph was 89, and it says Mary was 14. I don't know if my dad's watching right now. He's been kind of sick. But one of the funniest stories my dad said that he remembers from my childhood, and I just figured I'd throw this in here. When I was about five, <clears throat> my mom took me to the store, and I started a conversation with some little boy in the grocery store. I think I was four. And we were talking, and my mom overheard me say at four years old to this little boy that my dad is 89 and my mom is 14. <laughs> and so for this whole time, whenever I talk to my dad, not every time, but for periodically, my father will say, I'll say something like, well, how old is that you know, person? Or how old is that person? He'll say, he's 89 and she's 14 always kind of bringing up this joke from my childhood. I find that hilarious that today's our 89th episode, in a good way, please. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. But this is our 89th episode of, of Explaining the Faith. Joseph was 89, Mary was 14. So was God at work even in a four-year-old kid? Who knows? But I find that a little interesting. All right, let's go to our next slide. This is important, the terror of demons. Now, there is a great thing online by a Father Hugh Barber from Catholic Answers, and I want to I take from some things that he put together because I have read so much on St. Joseph. Father Don has some amazing things, Father Don Calloway. Um, but when I was doing my talk on spiritual warfare last year, which you can find online, I came across some stuff, and then when I was in seminary, I dug up my notes, and it was confirmed with my seminary course. So this is a beautiful way to take you back to seminary, as we always say, to give you that opportunity to attend seminary with me without paying tuition and without having to leave your own home um, and have to be celibate at the same time. So in my spiritual warfare training, and in this article by Father Hugh Barber, and Father Don talks about this, there's some incredible concepts I want to share with you right now that blow me away. This, to me, is some of the most powerful things I've ever going to have talked about in these 89 episodes. And so this is why St. Joseph's Day today, this is a powerful time to talk about this. All right, we know St. Joseph is the greatest of saints after Mary. <clears throat> He terrifies demons. Now, why did he get that title? Extremely interesting. Because these demons cannot see what he's doing. Now, you might be like me, always learn that the demons can see everything we do and even have access to our intellect. They can't control our will, but they can affect our intellect. They can put things into our mind, but they cannot touch our will. They can't force us to do something. That's our choice. But the demons can't see anything St. Joseph is doing. Why? All right. Spirits do not have feelings and emotions like us. 
but they have an intellect and a will like us. They can reason, they can rationalize, and they make choices. This is why the demons had a choice to accept God or not at the time of the fall. They had the intellect to contemplate it, then they had the will to choose it, just like us. Now, they are more powerful than we are by nature and the way they're created, and they are invisible, so it makes them even more powerful. And they perceive the movements of our emotions and imaginations. I can't emphasize enough how important it is for you to safeguard your emotions and your imagination. This is why you have to be so careful what you do in the privacy of your own time. The demons can get a lot of information about us. And and again, I'm referring here now. I know many of you are going to disagree. I'm giving you church teaching, what I learned in seminary, Father Don Calloway, Father Hugh Barber, Chris Sparks, our theologian, myself, others, teachings of the church. So the demons can get a lot of information about us from what comes across the screen of our memory, our imagination, and our emotions. If we don't guard those, it's like putting all your information out in cyberspace for anybody to take and use against you. You want to put your credit card information out there to the world on the web? I guarantee you somebody will take it and use it against you. This is what you do when you don't safeguard your memory, your imagination, or your emotions. They then use that to tempt you, and then if you really are doing it, you will open portals. This is why, for instance, pornography is so dangerous. The mystics tell us that every time you look at an image, and this doesn't even have to be graphic, Men are more visual, so men will look more at pictures. Women are more sensitive. They'll do more like reading stories. This is the same thing with reading a, I'm sorry, I don't know the better term, a romance novel, okay? What happens that the mystics tell us is that when we look at these images or we create these fantasies, especially if you're talking like pornography on the internet, Behind each image is a demon. And behind each image that you are engaging in, now opening up your imagination, you are recalling memory maybe with a past person, you are now opening up a portal. And that portal, if you open up your door or window in a torrential downpour, water is going to come in. Right now, there is a torrential downpour of demonic activity, and if you open that door, a portal, they will come in. And it can be other things, too. You know, the possession of the movie The Exorcist is actually based on a true story. I read that transcript in seminary, in one of my courses. I read the real transcript And you know that that transcript was actually scarier than the movie. I'll never forget reading that. It was actually a boy. It wasn't a girl. And the boy, the door or the portal was open through the Ouija board. And so any of these type of activities can open the door. What do we do? How do we defend against this? St. Joseph. Let's look at this. Now, these here, these portals that can be opened. Now, demons are not fully omniscient. They're not like God. They don't know everything. God prohibits them from knowing everything. But they can use what you give them, what you put out there. You willingly fill your mind and heart with wrath, anger, unforgiveness, lust, you might as well just tear open the shield over your soul 
and then say, come on in. So this is where we need a St. Joseph to guard that. And we'll explain why he's the terror of demons. So they can only use what you reveal to them. All right? They can't access your deepest inner spiritual thoughts and intentions that you give to God. Even if you struggle, even if you do struggle with these types of things, give it to God. Pour the precious blood over it. Have Mary put her mantle over it and have St. Joseph stand guard over it. Then you're protected. You can't be safe enough but they can see the part of your thoughts and feelings that are linked to your bodily senses. So if, if you are ravaged by lust or gluttony or sloth, those are tied to your bodily activities. Sloth, you're lazy, your body doesn't want to move. Lust, you're desiring sexual activity. Gluttony, feed me, feed me, feed me. It doesn't have to be food. More TV, more cell phone, more internet, more... Um, bad movies, these kinds of things. Now, since we have had, we definitely as humans have a hard enough time as it is to govern our own imaginations and passions, that's difficult enough on our own. Now we have to guard against the added attacks of these demons. This is real stuff. I know regularly I get comments saying this is a fairy tale and imagination and hocus pocus. Tell that to Jesus in the Bible. His whole ministry was heavily involved with evoking demons. And he even told the apostles that some of these demons are so tough they can only come out through prayer and fasting. Prayer to St. Joseph is one of the reasons. Now, we need to know that they are incessant, these demons, in their attacks to drag us down to hell with them. Now, why? All right, here's what's really interesting. Do you know that the tradition, and I use small t, this is not dogma or doctrine, but small t teaching of the church. Do you know when the world will end? Nobody knows the date or the hour. But the small t tradition of the church is that the world will end when the number of human souls enters heaven to replace the number of souls of the demon or the angels that fell from the sky that day. Now, tradition tells us there's billions of angels, way more than human, humans, way, way more, multitudes more of angels than human beings that have ever lived. There's seven and a half billion people in the world today, maybe close to eight billion now. Science tells us there's about 115 billion have lived since the beginning of time. There is way more angels than that. And small t tradition, not doctrine, not dogma, says the world will end when the number of human souls enters heaven to replace the number of angels that fell from heaven that day. Now, here's what's interesting. We are meant to take the place of those demons who fell. So the demons are bitterly jealous. And this is why they want to destroy us. They are bitterly jealous of their lost status and don't want a mere human being like you to take their spot. This is why they have hatred towards us. They know that this will happen ultimately. They're not stupid but they have an obsession with trying to find out who will be lost with them on the last day. You want to know why they want to know? You want to know why the demons want to know so badly who will be lost with them on the last day? Because then they give up on you. You're already gone. Then they go on to the next person. So if you're being attacked, it actually, this sounds so ironic, it's actually a good sign. If you're being attacked, you ever wonder why people say, why is it that all these celebrity atheists in Hollywood or great athletes seem to have no, they're just, they have everything. They have no challenges, no troubles. 
Well, you see a lot of them going into depression now. You see a lot of them going into anxiety now because they don't have God. But for the most part, it seems like it's the faithful Christian that is bearing the weight of the cross, being attacked incessantly. It's actually a good sign. I once heard it said that we're like a bag of marbles that Satan holds and he drops the bag of marbles. If you drop a bag of marbles at your feet, some marbles are going to be right there and other marbles are going to be rolling away. Which one is Satan going to go after? He's not going to go after the marbles right at his feet. They're already there. He's going to stretch and reach out for the ones that are rolling away from him towards God. The closer you get to God, the more the attacks will happen. And so don't see it as God hates me or God abandons me. See it that that means you're getting closer to God. The problem is, are we ready for those attacks? Are we able to withstand those attacks? St. Joseph was, and this is what we can learn. I'm, I'm getting to St. Joseph here. So, all right, this, this is so important all right, so these demons are jealous, don't want us to take their place. They know it will ultimately happen, but they are determined to find out who will join them in hell. They want to know this. This is why they are so intensely interested in what is going on inside you. They want to know what path you're on. Because if you're on the path to God, they want to get you before it's too late for them. If you're heading on the way to damnation, they want to make sure they coax you right over the cliff. We have no clue of the spiritual attack and the battle that is going on right now that we can't see. They want, in order to wage this war, they want intelligence. You know how all wars are won? Go back to World War II. The reason we defeated the Nazis is because we discovered and broke the Enigma Code, intelligence. The reason we defeated Japan, the evil empire of World War II, was because the code breakers cracked their code in the South Pacific and in Midway, which turned the whole course of the war around in five minutes. In five minutes, the entire course of World War II was changed when they broke the code of the Japanese and Wade McCluskey and his dauntless dive bombers discovered the Japanese fleet. The entire thing changed. Intelligence intelligence. This is what the demons want. They are like spies looking for clues on anything they can find. Don't put your information out online. Guard your emotions, your sentiments, your imaginations. Keep it free. Keep it pure. Ask God and St. Joseph to guard it. Now, yes, even if they tempt us and we fall, which will happen, they can never be sure that that fall will end us in hell. Only God knows the full culpability of our soul. Only God does. They can never be sure to see the true state of your soul. They can see what direction you're going. Only God can do this, or the saints and angels that God gives this grace to them. But let me tell you, they're gonna try. All right, they seek the consolation of having a great certitude that you are going to be lost. And the way you live your life is the key. You know, I said the other day in a homily, surprisingly, people who rail against God and are angry with God and almost disgusted because, God, how could you let my daughter die of cancer? Those people, according to the saints, actually are closer to God than the apathetic who just say, I don't care. That's why Jesus said the lukewarm sinner is the worst, the apathetic. He said, I'd rather you hot or cold. What does he mean by that? Hot means you're in line with them. You're preaching the gospel. Cold means I'm angry with you, God. I don't understand you. But actually, that's a better sign than just being, I don't care. What time's the game on? This is important. Now, in the light of this demonic struggle, we can see why Joseph is invoked as the terror of demons. Now we're getting to St. Joseph. The greatest saints on earth were impervious, meaning just immune to the attacks of the devil on their inner lives. How? Because by a special grace, 
They had such control over their feelings and their emotions, their memory, their imagination, that the demons were not able to be able to figure them out. The demons were not able to surmise their thoughts and intentions because they kept them guarded. They submitted them to the precious blood. Every morning you ask that the precious blood be poured over you, not just externally to protect you and your body from harm. Like I'm flying, I got to get on the plane today right after this talk. I will always pray, protect me on the, everybody on this flight. But it's more than the external. Pour the precious blood upon your memory, your intellect, in your will, your imagination, safeguard it from fantasies and impurities and ill will, such as hatred and unforgiveness. When we do those things, we're putting our credit card information, as I said, right online for the demons to gobble it up. So, <clears throat> before them, these saints, the demons are powerless. They stop and they actually, if you invoke one of these great saints to guard your soul and the demons come after you, listen to this. The mystics and saints tell us that these demons have to stop and reveal themselves in their attempt to get at you. And this makes perfect sense. Do you remember the gospels when the demons were attacking the sick people and Jesus would come and then all of a sudden, Jesus would command them, and all of a sudden, they were helpless. They started spilling their guts. We know you're the Son of God. Don't torture us. They were powerless. Now, we don't have that power, but God designates that power to the greatest of the saints. And right at the top of the list of Mary and Joseph, our Lord is obviously the first, the greatest. Our Lady is second, and St. Joseph is third, and John the Baptist is fourth invoke that whole line. They had such a serene sense of life that there was nothing there for the demons to attack. There was nothing for the demons to take. This is different from us. We have so many images and memories and feelings beyond our control and we let it control us. You know, I, I, I struggled for years after breaking up. In fact, I almost left the priesthood. In fact, I did for a year because I couldn't get the feeling of an ex-girlfriend out of my head. Not, not, not in a bad way, but just in an attachment. And in the, the devils can play havoc on that with a priest. If I'm attached to a creature rather than the creator, the devil has a field day with me especially as a priest. And if you're attached to another creature besides God or your spouse, you can commit emotional adultery. It doesn't have to be physical. And the demons can have a field day with that. Protect yourself. God bless you. All right, next. Let's look at our next slide. Remember how Satan tempts Jesus in the desert? He wasn't able to come away with anything. He wasn't able to get any useful information. Jesus stuck to the publicly revealed scripture and doesn't give away anything internal. The devil couldn't even figure out who he was because Jesus was recollected, constant in control of his emotions and his passions. The devil can't be sure exactly who Jesus even was there or what he was up to. And so this is why the devil feared him. It's the same with St. Joseph. The devil can't figure out who he is or what he's doing because St. Joseph is so perfectly guarded. So he calls him the terror of demons, the, terror, the demons terror, uh, flee in fear. So let's look more at St. Joseph here. The great theologians have told us that even though he was not conceived without sin like Mary, he never committed sin. Did you know this? Tradition tells us, again, small t, not dogma or doctrine, that yes, only Mary was conceived without original sin and only Mary um, was given that grace. But St. Joseph and John the Baptist, number three and four, right behind Jesus, one, Mary, two, St. Joseph, three, John the Baptist, four. Three and four, they had some special graces. Tradition tells us that yes, they were conceived with sin, not like Mary, they were not immaculately conceived, but they were purified in the womb. When was John the Baptist purified? When Mary came on the visitation in front of Elizabeth and the child leapt in the womb, he was purified. And tradition says neither Joseph nor John the Baptist committed actual sin. 
They were born, I'm sorry, conceived with original sin. Now, what this means is that Joseph's imagination and memory and feelings are not accessible to the demons. They're perfectly guarded. They can't see it. These powers were completely under the control of his intellect and will. Freedom, free intellect, free will. So even in his earthly life, they feared him as one whom they could not penetrate. This comes from all the church fathers. I'm not making this up. Father Don says this, this Father John Barber. The fallen angel's knowledge is their principal weapon in attacking you. And the only knowledge they can have is what you give them. If they are deprived of knowledge, they have only fear and frustration. Even more, if they perceive that the person whom they can't figure out seems to be really close to God, they know that that one will have even more power to confound them. The thing is, if you're one of those marbles rolling off to God, but you're not protected, you're not safeguarded, you don't have control of your passions and your, and your memory and your intellect and your will, they'll come get you, or at least try. What you want to do is be one of those marbles rolling off to God, but then invoke St. Joseph to safeguard over you. Ask him to protect your intellect, your memory, your passions, your imagination. Don't let the demons have access. This intense love and pure inner life of St. Joseph frightens the demons. He terrifies them because they can't see what he is up to. I find this fascinating. And it makes perfect sense. They can know we're praying to him, but can't see what he's doing with it. They can't see his movements, his influence, or his tactics to help us. It's kind of like the stealth plane that is completely undetectable by radar. Satan's and the demon's radar shows no blip when St. Joseph is out there working. So they don't know where he's at. As they're ready to launch an attack on you, they're worried about his attack on them, but they can't see him. They don't know where he is. They're going to be much less inclined to come after you if St. Joseph is guarding over you. And all this I'm saying also applies to the Blessed Mother. This is why they're so powerful. This is incredible. He is, as it was, or as it were, the most terrifying of mortal enemies because he's an invisible man. This is a special grace that not even all the saints have. The demons are constantly taken by surprise by his help of sinners. Because again, they don't know where he is. They don't know what he's up to. They don't know what he's up to. And, and then he'll strike, crush them like Mary. He aids St. Joseph in temporal and bodily needs. He teaches the life of prayer. He directs events for our good. He's all at work. Now, this is why St. Teresa of Avila, one of my favorite saints, and when I read of her devotion to St. Joseph, I was like, man, that makes perfect sense why she has such a devotion. St. Teresa of Avila and St. Francis de Sales especially, they said his intercession is ready, powerful, and perfect. And these are doctors of the church. What is a doctor of the church? It means you have special guarantee that you can follow their teaching. Their teaching has a particular authority, even over all the other saints. And we only have a couple dozen uh, doctors in the church in the history of the tens of thousands of saints. He obtains for us a more serene inner life so that we can be less subject to the tax of the demons. St. Ignatius of Antioch said this, the virginity of Mary, check this out, this is so amazing. There are three things Satan was not allowed to know. St. Ignatius of Antioch said this was revealed to him. One, the virginity of Mary. All right. Two, her giving birth to Jesus Christ. They didn't know that that was the Son of God. And third was his death. Remember, Satan was trying to figure out he actually wanted this Jesus guy to die, not knowing about the resurrection. Basically, St. Ignatius says these three great mysteries 
were done in the stillness of God. They were not revealed to Satan, but guess who was a witness at all three? St. Joseph. St. Joseph was present. In him, the devil could not find any stray thought or imagination. We should entrust God's deepest plans for us and our innermost desires to his intercession so that we will be protected from these demons. They flee in terror, unable to act against this invisible man. Let's look at this video. I want to show this video because with knowing all this, I want to pause for a moment and we all pray together. One of the most ancient prayers in the history of the church that they believe is 1900 years old. One of the most ancient prayers we have in the entire church, the oldest of all, is this prayer. Let us please join together now in prayer as we watch this prayer read on the screen. And us here in the shrine together, let us also remain in a moment of silence asking St. Joseph to help us. Let's watch this video. Prayer for St. Joseph's intercession. O oh, St. Joseph, whose protection is so great, so strong, so prompt before the throne of God, I place in you all my interests and desires. O oh, St. Joseph, do assist me by your powerful intercession and obtain for me from your divine Son all spiritual blessings through Jesus Christ our Lord so that having engaged here below your heavenly power, I may offer my thanksgiving and homage to the most loving of fathers. O Saint Joseph, I never weary contemplating you and Jesus asleep in your arms. I dare not approach while he reposes near your heart. Press him in my name and kiss his fine head for me and ask him to return the kiss when I draw my dying breath. Saint Joseph, patron of departed souls, pray for us. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. And that prayer, being one of the most ancient and oldest in the history of our faith, captures everything in the role of St. Joseph as the terror of demons. And so let us pray that prayer. Pray that prayer whenever you can or whenever you need help. All right, let's, let's change gears now and go, let's look at our next slide, if Brother Mark can put on the screen here. Um, this is an interesting apparition. The apparitions in Cognac, France. This is St. Joseph's little known appearance in the country of France. And you see on the screen, as Brother Mark is showing it, this happened in June of 1660 to a shepherd. And so let's talk about a little bit about this. All right, this is a very powerful apparition that you've never heard of. We hear a lot about Marian apparitions. How many St. Joseph apparitions have you heard about? Well, this is a big one. All right, in this apparition, St. Joseph spoke to a young shepherd who um, followed his directive and this ended up leading to many miracles. What happened? All right, we all know that Jesus, Joseph appeared at Fatima along with Our Lady in October 13th, 1917. And after the miracle of the Son, our Blessed Mother appeared again. That's when actually he appeared with her, joining St. Joseph, holding the child Jesus. Both the Christ child and Joseph blessed the world. But Joseph, like the Bible, remained silent. He remained silent. Now, this is not the only appearance of Joseph and Mary made in a single place in Europe. And in fact, my grandparents, the names of my grandparents were Joseph and Mary. And they were Slavs. But I remember my grandma had a statue of St. Joseph. And I remember as a little kid, because my grandpa's name was Joseph and her name was Mary. And I remember as a little kid looking at that statue of St. Joseph and it looks exactly like this one. And I always wonder, is that the one she had? It's one of his appearances. Now, it's not the only time that Joseph and Mary appeared together, it was not at Fatima, but here in France. Now, 
These were lesser known apparitions that happened even earlier than Fatima. Let's go to our next slide. Here's a picture of a stained glass window that captures this occasion where both Joseph and Mary visited this little village of Cotignac, France. Here on the screen, you see the child Jesus with Mary. Now this happened separately to begin with. All right, what's going on? All right, in the summer of 1660, it was exceptionally hot. Then on June 7th, the date we just saw, a young shepherd named Gaspard Ricard was searching for fresh grass and some shade on Mount Basilian to lie down. Next thing he knew, there was a tall man standing next to him. All right, came out of nowhere, pointing to a large boulder. He told the man, I am Joseph. Lift it and you will drink. Now getting clean water then was a challenge. So this boulder was huge, but the shepherd listened to the man and tried to lift the rock. To his amazement, he was able to lift the boulder. And under it, he discovered a fresh water spring. Now, he looked up to thank the stranger, but the man was gone. And the shepherd went and told all that happened to the local townspeople. Now, the, the local town knew this guy, this humble shepherd, so everybody believed him. He was a very honest man. And they all rushed to see where this new spring of water was, where there had never been water before. Now, I'm getting this from the documentary called The Shrine of the Holy Family, which was on EWTN. Now, I trust EWTN. I know Colin and there are other theologians down there. And I trust EWTN. They always do their due diligence. They're good partners of ours. Um, we have our, our show called Living Divine Mercy on the EWTN network every Wednesday. And so this information that I'm getting is from there. So I know you're gonna, many people are gonna write and say, where is this in the Bible? Remember, God doesn't stop communicating with his people just because the Bible has been finished being written. God still is gonna communicate with his people. The Bible doesn't talk about nuclear war. Why? Because nuclear war didn't exist at the time of the Bible. But do we think God has nothing to say about nuclear war? So he uses apparitions. Mary, Joseph, saints, St. Padre Pio or St. Therese. You know, um, more people wrote in saying Fatima is not in the Bible. Well, at this point, we've got to use a little bit of reason here. Fatima is not in the Bible because Fatima apparitions didn't exist at the time the Bible was written. They happened 1,900 years later. Now, does that mean then that God stops talking to his people? No. So anyway, I'm getting this from this documentary, and it tells how the water had a lot of healing qualities and attracted people from all over. And because of the number of people who came, they decided to build a chapel there. Now the church does officially teach one of the best signs of the trueness of an apparition is if a church is built there. Did you know that? That's one of the surest signs that an apparition is true and authentic is a fact if a church was built there because God is the one behind the building of a church. So healings began at the sanctuary and at the spring, many reported miracles, but this spring has never dried up. Now, the word spread, and even King Louis XIII, who had, consecrate, I'm sorry, who had consecrated himself, right, four years earlier, took notice of this, and he not only consecrated himself, but his throne and all of France to the Virgin Mary. Because remember now, Mary and Joseph are appearing here. This is why it's unique. He was moved to do so because he and his wife, the queen, knew about the apparition of Mary at that same site of this chapel of Our Lady of Graces. Now in Con Contiac, two miles away, St. Joseph appeared. So they're right there. So on January 31st of the next year, 1661, 
the local bishop combine these sites of both apparitions, Mary and Joseph, because they were very near to each other, under the title Sanctuary of the Holy Family. Boy, do we need that today. I can think of no phrase that better summarizes what we need today more than the sanctuary of the Holy Family. To me, if you're going only by names, I think that is the most powerful. The sanctuary of the Holy Family. Wow, do we need this. Now, there is not one instance in the gospel where Joseph speaks. And in France, he only said one small phrase. I'm Joseph, lift that rock. <laughs> so the local priest said, his silence is not about being mute or having nothing to say. And this is a lesson for all of us, first and foremost myself. He only spoke words that mattered. This priest said one lesson that we can all learn from today. And he said, quote, in opposition, our world suffers from an avalanche of words, words that hurt, words that pierce, words whose meaning are constantly even changing, like the word marriage has now changed. Religious freedom has changed. All these things are changing. Gender has changed. Man or woman has changed. That, that's like the most unchangeable of all things that exist in the universe man or woman, and yet we've managed to change the meaning of those words. Well, they haven't changed. Society says so. It seems, he says, the more people speak, the less they know and communicate. The silence of Joseph is the opposite. It is not empty. It is only the absence of unnecessary words. What a great lesson. So, with his short directive to the shepherd, pick up the rock, St. Joseph spoke a whole treasure tro trove of learning. When Joseph heard the words of God in his simple directions, Joseph immediately acted. You know what we're talking about? He didn't stop and ask for explanations. You know, I, I think back in one of my meditations, I remember if, because there's a, a form of prayer called Lexio Divina where you read scripture and then you put yourself right into the scene. And it was reading the scripture passage of the word to Joseph about pick up the family, move to Egypt. And I remember the lesson God had in that for me in my prayer was clear. Because if I was sleeping and God came to me and says, all right, pack up everything and move to Egypt, I would be like, okay, wait a minute. Will I have enough money? Where do I stop along the way? Have you provided for my shelter? Will the weather be okay? Are we going to walk? What route are we going to take? I mean, God would just shake his head at me. But instead, St. Joseph just went and he did it at once. Or what about when he told him to take Mary into his home? I put myself in that prayer too. What a learning experience when you pray Lexio Divina with these gospel passages. Because, you know, when, and I was engaged to be married. And I have no problem sharing something personal. I, I, I one time had thought that my fiance may have been unfaithful and I was devastated. Ended up not being true, praise be to God. But I was devastated. There would have been no way that I would have just jumped into the marriage and went forward like nothing happened. I want, in my stubbornness, I want proof. Joseph could have done that. Joseph could have said, Lord, you got to show me and prove to me that she wasn't unfaithful. But Joseph trusted. Now, we're not saying be blindly ignorant, but... Trust covers them. So this is amazing, all right? Now, the shepherd must have grasped this because he didn't ask Joseph, how am I gonna lift this rock? You know, I could throw out my back 
you're asking me to lift this really big boulder, but you better show me how I'm going to do this. You better get me a long fulcrum because I'm going to throw out my back trying to lift that rock. No, he didn't ask Joseph how he could lift it. He just did it. Joseph had the faith. This is powerful. Joseph had the faith that moved mountains. And here we are taught the same to this shepherd who immediately and went and moved a small mountain. Certainly, he got supernatural help for his trust and the healings found. This is kind of like St. Joseph being those four men in the gospel. All those healings were from the trust of St. Joseph. So invoke him. St. Joseph follows what his son Jesus did in healing the sick, comforting the afflicted. You know, the Benedictine sisters are there um, at the monastery connected with this sanctuary. And they report, quote, St. Joseph brings many children back to their parents, protects the unborn, reconciles feuding families, and that he also helps people with their financial difficulties. You're having financial difficulties? Pray for his intercession, especially St. Joseph of Contiac in France. Now, let's finish up with the last part, because I think this is really strong. Let's look at our next slide. You want to know puts a stamp of approval for the role of St. Joseph for me is St. Faustina. St. Faustina had devotion. Let's read what St. Faustina said. This is from her diary. St. Joseph urged me to have a constant devotion to him. He himself told me to recite three prayers, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, and the Glory Be, along with the Memorare to St. Joseph. Once daily. He looked at me with great kindness and gave me to know how much he is supporting this work of mercy. Wow, St. Joseph is with us. He has promised me his special help <clears throat> and protection. <clears throat> I recite the requested prayers every day and feel his spiritual, I'm sorry, special protection. What a beautiful prayer. But it doesn't end there. I mentioned St. Teresa of Avila, doctor of the church. She was hugely devoted to St. Joseph. She said, to other saints, the Lord seems to have given us special grace to help us in some aspect of our lives, like a certain thing. That's what a patron saint is, all right? You're struggling with cancer. God gave the patron saint of St. Peregrine. So he gives, she said, it looks like God gives certain saints for certain needs. But St. Joseph, she says, helps in all of them. Also that the Lord wishes to teach us that he was him. Now, okay, I know I've been saying this a lot, but this one really struck me. St. Teresa of Avila said, the Lord wishes to teach us that he himself was subject on earth to St. Joseph. So in heaven right now, he also does anything St. Joseph asks. You go to St. Joseph, you get him on your side, you get him to protect you, Jesus won't say no. This is amazing. A special favor. This has also been the experience of other persons whom I have talked to and have advised to commend themselves to St. Joseph. You know, St. Teresa of Avila wanted to persuade everyone to be devoted to St. Joseph. Let's look at our next slide. This is St. Uh, Therese. Um, let's look what she says. I am astonished at the great favors which God has bestowed on me through St. Joseph and at the perils from which he has freed me, both in body and in soul. Wow. All right, now, she has some great quotes here. Um, she says, for I have great experience of the blessings which, can, which he can obtain from God. She said, I do not remember that I have ever asked anything of him which he has failed to grant. Incredible, huh? 
All right, finally, the dreams. We all ask about dreams. We all seem to want to know where these dreams come from, what do they mean. Dreams are very, you got to be very careful. Not every dream is a prophecy. Like if you dream you're going to get hurt if you go to that location. That's not always true. Dreams don't always have to be taken so literally. Sometimes they can have no meaning at all. But sometimes they can. Now, are you culpable for your dreams? Father Benedict Rochelle used to say no. He used to say, don't get upset if you have a dream because you're not fully culpable. But dreams can reflect what's going on in your mind and heart. Let's listen to this. Let's first talk about the dreams of St. Joseph. All right, God himself even used St. Joseph in his dreams in order to direct him, which tells us a lot about St. Joseph. Okay, the Desert Fathers and the great theologians like St. Thomas Aquinas tell us that our dreams can in a way reflect the state of our passions and emotions. Not always. When a person is of high sanctity or of deep simplicity of heart, his dreams are clearer and safer guides than usually the rest of us, whose dreams, like mine, are a mixed bag. All right, a mixed bag of whatever is churning inside of us. All right? Now, we as religious, we pray the divine office. You've probably heard me mention this. We have morning prayer, evening prayer. There's a, a, a certain prayer called compline. That means night prayer. And when we pray that, we pray surprisingly in the hymn, we pray to be, be delivered from any deceptions coming from the devil playing games with our unguarded imagination as we sleep. Now, this whole first part of the talk, we talked about your unguarded imagination. It's so important that we religious, in our compline, our night prayer, we pray for protection that the evil one does not play games with our unguarded imagination as we sleep. Because we are all over the place. Now, this is good general advice to, like I said, always, you know, avoid trying to always find meaning and direction in our dreams, but sometimes they can tell us some things. Like if we're restless. Now, St. Joseph was so pure and so attuned to the things of God, he received direction in his sleep. You know, I used to say, God, why don't you do that for me? I want to know your will. I remember when I was deciding, trying to struggle every day, it was torment. Do I get married or become a priest? Do I get married? Do I become a priest? It was torture. One day I would get up, I was convinced that God's will in my life was to get married. The next day I wake up, I was convinced God's will for me was to become a priest. Now I'm like, God, you're not the God of confusion. You got to clarify this. Why don't you just give me a dream like St. Joseph? I remember vividly praying that. Well, it's probably because my dreams, my emotions, my imaginations weren't safeguarded. They weren't fully attuned with God. And he couldn't use that as a tool for me yet. I find that very interesting. And so St. Joseph was so attuned to God that he could receive direction in his sleep. For him, there was no question, even if things were difficult, like we said, fleeing to Egypt or moving Mary into his home. In Matthew's gospel, there's four places that refer to the dreams and sleep of St. Joseph. One of them is called, believe it or not, you may not even know this, the Annunciation of St. Joseph. We think of the Annunciation of Mary where St. Gabriel came, the angel Gabriel came. 
But the Annunciation of St. Joseph kind of parallels Mary's Annunciation. It's not surprising, as we've always said, that devotion, when, you, when, when devotion to St. Joseph began to grow in the Catholic Church, we got to see this fact in art and in statues reflecting Joseph in his sleep. You know, it's interesting. There are many paintings and even statues of Jesus or uh, Joseph dreaming in his sleep. Let's take a look. This is one of them that you can get right on Shop Mercy. Father Don, when he wrote Consecration of St. Joseph, this is one of his favorite statues, the one of St. Joseph sleeping. Now, if you're lazy and slothful, don't use this as an excuse. You know, I'm not going to get up and go to work because I'm going to be like St. Joseph. I'm going to sleep all day. No, we don't use that as an excuse. Do you know that Pope Francis has a devotion to the sleeping Joseph? He actually, this is interesting, he has a statue of St. Joseph, the one we just showed, of him sleeping. And he has a statue with a little drawer at the base of it. So St. Joseph is sleeping like on this drawer. And when he has a special intention, he writes it down and places it in the drawer, asking St. Joseph to dream of his petition before God and for God to give direction through his intercession. So this devotion has begun to spread wildly in the last couple years, especially since the year of St. Joseph. So entrust your intentions to it. You know that expression, I'll sleep on it? You know where that comes from? It comes from St. Joseph. See, we have such prevalent effect of Christianity on culture and we don't even know it. We want to reject God at every turn, but you'll turn right around and say, you know what, thank you for asking me that, I'll sleep on it. That comes directly from the tradition of St. Joseph sleeping on it. So you don't even know all the times you're invoking Christian tradition. That's where that expression comes from. So if you let St. Joseph sleep on your petitions, there is no doubt you will benefit. Why not? I mean, God entrusted his own beloved son and the mother of his son to the care of St. Joseph. We should too. You know, we should do no less regarding those in our lives, entrusting them to St. Joseph. All right, so... We're wrapping up. Today is St. Joseph's Day. Today is March 19th. Again, even if you're watching this days later, don't worry, he's still there. Today, St. Joseph is the patron saint of fathers, both biological and spiritual fathers, like priests. He is also the patron saint of those who grow up without a father. Did you know that? Think of all those poor young men and, and girls in depressed areas that don't have fathers, estranged, abandoned. And so often as a consequence of the devil's war on the family, we see brokenness. This is a war that the devil has waged on the church and the family. Those are the two biggest areas a war which fatherhood is under attack. You've heard me say this, but I'll say it again. In my secular life, my favorite TV shows were Simpsons, Home Improvement, Everybody Loves Raymond, King of Queens, Married with Children. I loved those shows. But in every one, the father is a bumbling buffoon idiot. It's almost culture's way of trying to destroy the patriarchy. There's a huge, quote-unquote, movement that wants to destroy the patriarchy, and they're getting funds from millions of corporations, millions of dollars in funds. Their goal is to destroy the patriarchy. Why do we want to destroy the, pa the, the fatherhood? I don't understand Let's look at our next slide. This is a symbol of the Holy Family. This is it. 
The saints tell us if you want to attack God, you need to attack fatherhood. God is father. If you want to attack the priesthood, you attack fatherhood. That's what's happened to the priesthood in the scandal. We've lost our sense of fatherhood. If you want to attack the family, you need to attack fatherhood. The father is the head of the family. The powers of darkness have not given up on this. They keep coming, wave after wave of attack. Pray to St. Joseph. Pray to St. Joseph. You know, our last slide is one of Sister Lucy. As she talked about this endgame strategy of Satan. Let's put up on the slide and read what she says. Sister Lucy of Fatima said, The final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Don't be afraid, because anyone who works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be fought and opposed in every way, because this is the decisive issue. However, Our Lady has already crushed its head. Powerful. St. Joseph, we need him now more than ever, and that's why I think the year of St. Joseph was declared. The huge success of Father Don Calloway's book, Consecration to St. Joseph. I personally believe God placed it at that strategic time in history. All the other battles that have been fought, God used the saints and strong Christians as the infantry. What do you do on your relay team, you always put the fastest runner as the anchor. Right now, all those other races have gone on. He's got St. Joseph as the anchor. Now, Mary's the coach. She's, she's, she's directing it all with the hand of God. But St. Joseph is running that anchor leg because the final battle of God and Satan will be over marriage and the family. And who is the head of the Holy Family? St. Joseph. It's amazing to think of the Holy Family, who was the greatest? Of course, Jesus. Who was the next greatest? Of course, Mary. Who was the third? I don't want to say least because his power isn't little, but the, by far in third different or third level was St. Joseph, but yet who was the head of the Holy Family? Joseph. And so if we want to withstand this battle and this final attack of Satan on human, humanity and mankind, we need to invoke St. Joseph. All that we've talked about today, St. Joseph. And Father, what about Blessed Mother Mary? She's hand in hand. It's her spouse. All right? So with that, I want to say thank you to all of you for joining us in 89 in but I feel incredible opportunities for us to come together as a Marian family. I announced at Mass yesterday that I will be taking a leave of absence. Um, I explained yesterday at the end of Mass, I have a, a very heavy heart. Um, there's a lot of issues going on in my family, and, and thank God for Father Kaz, who's such a beautiful shepherd, is allowing me to go home. I'm not leaving. Um, I will be back every couple weeks to celebrate Mass. I'll be back every couple weeks to, um, to, to do filming for our EWTN show. That will not stop. We will also continue First Saturdays. I will be flying in every month for First Saturdays, and we invite all of you who came here personally to come with us and you who are watching to come and join us personally every First Saturday. That is so important. I also be here for First Fridays. So every First Friday at 8 p.m. and every first Saturday of the month at 11 a.m., we're gonna continue those live. Now, the rest of the weeks, we're gonna do something special. We're not gonna quit. We're gonna show you each and every Saturday at the same time, 11 o'clock, you'll be happy to hear this, much shorter clips of parish missions that I have done in the past 
from the recordings that I have um, done in the past on our DVDs, our CDs, um, but we've not done these as part of explaining the faith yet on these 89 talks. Bits and information are similar sometimes, but we're gonna show those for the next 13 weeks. So actually it'd be more like 17 weeks because we have the first Saturdays in between. So for the next, let's say three months, if you come here live to the shrine, we'll be showing that down in Memorial Hall, which is down in the basement. So you can come and still watch the video here live with other people, but you online will still get it. And here's what I am excited about. I will join you live on the chat for each of those Saturday videos. Now, I think there's one I may not be able to because I'm speaking. I'm still maintaining some conferences and pilgrimages. Um, I'm not canceling my pilgrimage to Greece in the footsteps of, of St. Paul. If you'd like information uh, to join me on that pilgrimage, that'll be in October. Um, you can just Google footsteps of St. Paul with Stephen Ray. I am keeping that. I'm also keeping with Deacon Harold Silvers a pilgrimage to the shrines of France. And now we have to try to make sure we can fit in this visit to Cantignac. Um, so I will be keeping that um, uh, uh, pilgrimage. I canceled all other pilgrimages. I've canceled all other missions. I've canceled all other conferences to be able to care for my mom. Um, I ask for your prayers and know you're in our prayers. Um, my dad is in, was in the hospital and is finding it difficult to take care of her. We're finding very difficulty getting care. They live in a rural area and there's just been a lot of problems. My sister now has informed us she can't continue taking care of my mom. So I feel called by the Lord to go. Pray for my sister, pray for my family. We're praying for you. But please, I'm not, I'm not leaving. Um, I don't want rumors out there that what happened to Father Chris, he left the priesthood, he finally ran back to North Carolina. Um, you know, that kind of thing. No, no, no. Um, I love my priesthood. I, I can't imagine ever doing anything else. I, I can't ever imagine not being a priest. This is my love. This is, the Catholic faith is everything in the world to me. And so while I'm signing off as this being the last of the live um, uh, explaining the face for right now, please don't leave us. Please don't abandon us. We're gonna continue to provide videos. Our EWTN show will continue every Wednesday at 6.30 called Living Divine Mercy. Um, we will continue with our live stream masses, Brother Mark, Father, uh, Brother Ken. Um, we have Father Kaz will continue. We have a new great priest here, Father Gabe. He'll be joining in the live streams. Um, it will continue. Please don't abandon us in this mission of mercy. And we will continue to pray for you. And again, on every Saturday, even though we're not doing it live for a couple months, I will be joining you live on chat as we show these parish missions from around the country that I have done in the past. So I think we will keep up. Um, I think we will do okay. And St. Joseph, help us. Please pray for us. Um, so with that, I want to sign off. Um, but I did have um, there, my staff is yelling at me that I have not announced um, a Lenten special if Brother Mark can show um, two more slides. Uh, my book called Understanding Divine Mercy, our staff has put up for a Lenten special. Um, you can see on your screen, um, only $9.95 um, if you would like the book. Um, it's at shopmercy.org. And when you check out, if you enter the code word FAITH, you can get that for only $9.95. It's a Lenten special that we're doing um, for that. And if, if you can't afford one, you know, um, I, will, I will send it to you. You know, if you really, truly can't afford it, uh, just contact Peter James, my assistant. Uh, his name is Peter. His email is peterjames, one word, at marion.org. If you cannot afford that, uh, I will send you a copy. Um, and so, um, but otherwise, $9.95 if you can afford it, um, and we'll get that out to you. You can also call 1-800-462-7426 um, or 1-800-4-MARION. And lastly, the slide that we always show, become a Marian helper. Um, 
micprayers.org. It's a very simple website, but you can call or um, visit. You can join us. We, um, we would love to have you part of our Marian family. Um, you, this to me is everything. We don't care if you ever give a dollar. Uh, that's not what it's about. We want you to be with us in prayer. Um, our Marian family has grown since this COVID has started, and I think that's God bringing a greater good. All you have to do is visit micprayers.org. It takes but 10 seconds. <clears throat> it doesn't cost anything. But if you join us, you can share in all the spiritual benefits of all our rosaries, prayers, masses, penances, just like you were a Marian of the Immaculate Conception. That's a great deal because you get the same grace as I do as being a Marian from all of our rosaries, prayers, masses, penances, as I said, just simply by being a Marian helper. And I tell you, um, signing off for the last time, or at least temporarily for the last time, um, this really was in my heart when, uh, uh, as I said in the last week, I've had such a heavy heart. And the emails, the letters, and the comments of encouragement and love and support from all of you have been incredible. And it really hit me hard what a family we've become. Um, I read every single letter, email, and comment that you send me. Now, I apologize because it's physically impossible to respond to every one. I'm trying. You might get it two years later. But um, I have, you know, thousands of emails that I haven't gotten to yet. I've read them all, but the response sometimes is not as easy. But the prayers, the support, the comments of all of you have been incredible. And now I know why I'm a priest and I know why I'm a Marian. Um, when reading those, you see what a true family is. You see how God has done a greater thing with COVID, has brought together a great group of people that want to love and serve him. It's a tremendous gift to me. And so I wanted to take this opportunity just to say thank you to all of you um, who've been and will continue to be part of our Marian family. I'm excited because I will get to come back every couple of weeks. Father Kaz has given me the green light. Um, so it's gonna be a lot of travel, um, but I'm super excited to be able to spend time with my mom, but I'm super excited to be able to come back. So you will see me at masses popping up periodically. You will see me on first Saturdays. You will see me on the chat. Uh, every Saturday that I'm not here physically, but I'll be joining you on the chat. So there's a lot of good stuff to look forward to. But most of all, let's keep praying. Pray for the Ukraine, Ukraine, pray for Russia, pray for this conversion of Russia, pray for the consecration. And um, I know I keep saying this is it, but uh, don't forget on March 25th, um, the church will be joining together in a consecration prayer of Ukraine and Russia. And I will be joining that myself because the Holy Father has invited all the priests and bishops to be part of this. What an incredible opportunity for us to pray for peace in the world. And remember, Jesus said, mankind will not have peace until he turns with trust to his mercy. And so this is our opportunity to turn with trust to his mercy. Well, God bless all of you. This is not goodbye, but... It is a big thank you, and we'll see you throughout. And keep coming to the shrine, though, because every Saturday, as I said, we'll still play these, and we'll see you next Saturday as I log on with the chats for you. And until then, may Almighty God bless you, and through the intercession of St. Joseph, may he protect you and the Blessed Mother guide you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.